Everybody can hear me okay? It's great to be back in the region, and as Patrick and I were driving in yesterday from Wisconsin, we were glad you led us back to the state. So, um, my name is Jeff Stone. I'm a project manager, a research analyst with the Association of State Floodplain Managers, and we are located in Madison, Wisconsin. And for quickly those not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit uh, membership-based organization of approximately 15,000 individual members nationally. And we have chapters in almost every state. And kind of our major mission is reducing the losses of uh, property and loss of life to, to flooding. And also to really think about restoring or uh, conserving the, uh, the floodplains, the natural and beneficial functions of the floodplain. So we have those two major missions. And our members represent local, state, uh, federal officials, you know, in the public sector, but also on the private side from the engineering firms. So we do cross between the public and private sector. And like I said, we have 15,000 members and they represent, you know, emergency managers, building code officials, um, the, the floodplain managers that do the work at all of those levels. So that's who are, you know, who I work for and work with on a daily basis. And it's great to be here in this region to kind of as ASFPM and, and work with the local officials again. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the planning guide today and kind of three goals around the planning guide, just create awareness about the planning guide that we're developing, talk about all the individuals and collaborators and uh, organizations that we're working with, and then to set up the um, breakout sessions this afternoon, um, go through some of the issues and, and look at how we're capturing the information from a case study approach. And, and I'll get into each of those as we go through the presentation today. Um, so something that we, so we've been working on this about a year and a half and one of the early graphics that we put together that really captures I think what we're trying to do and that is our audience for the planning guide is the local practitioners, the floodplain managers, coastal managers, the planners at the local and county level and our goal is to connect them from that left side to those data and resources as quickly as possible through a process kind of case study approach to answer specific questions related around climate change and related around hazards within you know flooding and coastal erosion um, all the way and as I'll explain through the, the entire watershed so it's not just that coastal zone but we are capturing everything all the rivers and everything that drain and will come into and flow into the Great Lakes so we are Great Lakes wide in that aspect and and I, I will go through each of these and I'm trying not to turn away from the audience but so we'll take it from that from this audience to what we want to be able to let them do through the planning guide and here's where we have all of the collaborators and the people in the middle and the digital coast and the NOAA coastal, uh, coastal service center which um, I'll, I'll drop into a little bit more uh, digital coast is how we you know through those data and tools and resources how we're going to connect our audience with the answers that they're seeking through these case study approaches so um, you know, we're looking at all the different issues from uh, coastal flooding, uh, which might be a little bit more of a challenge with some of our lower lake levels right now, but we are, you know, but they're also within, like I said, the watershed and the, and the floodplain throughout the coastal watershed. And just to kind of put that in more word terms, um, the objectives of the planning guide, pretty straightforward. It is to look at those natural hazards and look at climate adaptation throughout that entire region within the Great Lakes, you know, for that, the floodplain throughout the, the watershed, as I just mentioned. And something that came up in one of the slides earlier is we want to provide locally relevant data. So that information that's provided specifically for your location, and this is throughout the Great Lakes, but there, you need that information that's locally relevant to drive these case studies, these best practices and successes that we're gonna be talking about and building within our case studies. Then we want to, as I mentioned, talk through these case studies. One of the things through the user needs surveys we've seen throughout the Great Lakes is having a process to guide people through, you know, and that's why it's called the planning guide, to drive them through from the, you know, what are their initial questions and objectives and problems and guide them through to solutions and strategies. And that's how our case studies were set up. And I'll walk you through that specific um, scenario or a four part framework for that. And then finally, what the opportunity that I've seen working over the last year and a half is to collaborate with a lot of individuals and a lot of organizations throughout the region to really bring this all together and, and uh, develop what we've done. And there's uh, more people that we're gonna bring into this and I'll, I'll um, highlight some of those as we go through the rest of this. 
The one thing I wanted to do is, um, and Heather mentioned this is kind of a beta version, we're just rolling this out, but this is what the website looks like right now. And uh, the URL is it's just Coastal Resilience or Great Lakes Resilience.org. And I'll have that up at the end to, uh, you can go to this site. But we're organized around kind of three topic areas right now. So all of the case studies will be organized in these three topic areas. And these will relate to our breakout sessions later today that we have one on land use and zoning, habitat and environment, and infrastructure. And so when I walk through one of the um, case studies that we have here, you'll see how that's put together, but they will be organized under these three topic areas. And the way that you can explore within the planning guide, there are kind of three ways. So the issue-based way is through the cases I just mentioned. I'll go into more detail with those. And the next way is through this kind of, um, here's the case study framework, sorry, and the four parts where we create awareness, understanding, analysis, and strategy. And get into that more in detail, but one of the other ways we're going to allow people to explore all the resources that are within the planning guide is through a map. And by doing this, what we can do is people can zoom around the map, pan around the map, and actually see counties as an example where other counties might have hazard mitigation plans or their comprehensive plans and allow you to access that information. So you can go up and see what your neighboring counties or communities have and move around the map and see, so it's another way of getting to the information. So it's a, a third way within here that we allow that to happen. And it's one of the more powerful ways that we've seen that people you know, want to see what their neighbors are doing in their communities. And this, so not only by mitigation plans, but other tools or resources that counties might have, you can move around the map and see what tools those communities have. And also within this, you can do who are, as an example, um, in Wisconsin, Brown County, they have their own zoning administrator that's the floodplain manager. So we can put those types of people in here and as you move around the map, you can see who are the floodplain officials, who are the planners as you pl go around the area and quickly get that information and explore it in that way. And the third way to kind of get in and look at the data, so if you're looking kind of across the tabs on the top of the website, you know, case studies I'll go into, we have a climate and environment kind of a background section which really is pulled from a lot of information from all the other resources within the Great Lakes region. We have the other resources, maps, tools, and data. There's a library for all the publications and hazard mitigation plans, comprehensive plans, ordinances will all be located in there. And then people and organizations as I just talked about. So the third way to kind of look through this information in the planning guide is kind of based on the resources that you want to find. And just here to highlight one of the people examples, the, in the state of Wisconsin for the DNR, the floodplain manager for the entire state is Gary Heinrich, and having that contact information quickly available through this type of interface. And as I mentioned, there have been a lot of collaborators, stakeholders as we worked, starting within Wisconsin, kind of the northeast section of Wisconsin, working across the Digital Coast Partnership, and that is NOAA Coastal Service Center, has a, um, a website that's called the Digital Coast, and that's the next slide that I'll talk a bit more about that. But together they form the, the Digital Coast Partnership, and as ASFPM and, and the Coastal Service Center is kind of leading this project on the planning guide within the region, we've worked with all of those partners. So that is the American Planning Association. A lot of these folks are in the room too and here that are representing and working with the planning guide. Uh, the American Planning Association, the Coastal States Organization, the National Association of Counties, the um, National States Geographic Information Council and the Nature Conservancy. And there's been two groups that are more recently coming into the Digital Coast Partnership, the Urban Land Institute and the National Estuary and Research Reserve Association. Um, but also we've worked heavily with the Sea Grant in Wisconsin and starting to reach out with Sea Grant throughout the Great Lakes region and also the UW Extension and Patrick and his group and been very helpful and a key player in, in helping pull together the planning guide. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the stakeholders, we've worked at the county and city level, getting an understanding of how the practitioners want the information and how they can it help them relate it to the elected officials and to the public, you know, kind of uh, on both sides for them. And then we have worked with regional planning associations and also at the state level right now, and that's what we continue to do and continue to do around the Great Lakes region with each of the eight states in the region. 
Um, as I mentioned, the, the digital coast is a big part of this, and connecting the planning guide with the tools and resources that NOAA is putting together is an incredible opportunity and also a great resource that we need to get out there, and there's a lot of rich information. And so the planning guide is to plan, you know, to connect to these types of resources in a uh, easily, uh, uh, easy way to get to the data. And so, as you see up here, the example, or you can start getting economic data at the coastal, at the county level. There's the coastal county snapshots. There's a flood hazard kind of component to that. Um, so at the county level, you can get what your flood exposure information is and very quick and easy to read information that you can provide. And it, this all is being made available through the planning guide at that local level. Another big part of what we're trying to connect with, and you'll hear more about this this afternoon as well, is the Nature Conservancy's The, um, the Climate Wizard and getting information on climate change and, and future scenarios and, and actually being able to download the data and if you have the capabilities, bringing it in and uh, having your GIS people you know, and use it within your local planning opportunities and, and management opportunities to pull together analysis and information. And I'm not gonna go into detail a lot of these because you'll hear more about these this afternoon. Um, another one is that we've started pulling in and, and has been recommended to us and we've started pulling information is from the sorry, Midwestern Regional Climate Center. And I think Molly's gonna be talking more about some of this later on, if I'm correct on that. And so there's a lot of information around the Great Lakes already and so we're just trying to provide that, again, the, as the planning guide, provide that kind of interface with a lot of these great tools and data and information that's out there. Um, two more that I'll quickly talk about that we're starting to want to work with and a lot of people that are developing case studies and best practices and success stories out there are the Great Lakes Adaptation Assessment for the Cities and Beth Gibbons is here and I think we'll be talking about that later and also with um, EcoAdapt and this, uh, I love the, the, the acronym here, CAKE, everybody loves CAKE, but it is the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange information so there's a lot of case studies and information we're trying to pull in from there as well and I could go on there I think the examples of the information that's out there um, and one of the problems and what we saw is there is so much information out there how do you pull it in digest it and bring it together and that's one of the goals of the planning guide as well um, to quickly cover and start talking about how our case studies are being brought together what case studies we have in progress, just you have a good understanding of that, um, and, and we see no end to this. We hear more and more ideas all the time, and we hope to hear more this afternoon. But just quickly, looking at coastal flood hazard designations in Wisconsin, that's one thing they were looking for. How do we communicate how that line on the ground is, uh, the, the flood hazard line on the ground is drawn, and, and helping the community understand that. The one that I'm gonna highlight here um, today, kind of walking through it is, the long-term bluff erosion, and I know there's not a lot of bluffs in our area here, but um, it is an example that we have fully fleshed out, and I just want to walk through an example so you understand what we're looking for later in the afternoon. Um, and a lot of considering climate change in the Western Lake Erie habitat restoration, so very relevant here. Developing a no-build zone ordinance with low lake levels, there's some pressure uh, developing lakeward again. So there's actually an ordinance in St. Joseph, Michigan. Uh, the economic valuation of port infrastructure, the infrastructure breakout session, we'll get into some of this more later. For Toledo and Duluth, some of that work has been done. Um, Gene Clark is here from Wisconsin Sea Grant. Um, land use strategies for reducing watershed impacts in Sheboygan and uh, in Wisconsin. Then also some ongoing work right now is economic assessment of green infrastructure and that's also happening in Toledo and in, um, in Duluth right now. So there's some things with uh, some people that are working on that right now with Patik and, and some of the NOAA folks in the, in the room here. Um, now jumping into what our case study structure is, so this really will kind of set up our talk for later today, along with some questions. I'm gonna get you also involved through some of our polling here shortly. Um, what the case study elements, I mentioned the four parts before. There's the awareness, the understanding, analysis, and strategy. So, you know, the awareness is what is the challenge or issue to be addressed or the opportunities that can be also addressed. Um, understanding what is the information we need to understand those issues. And then, you know, how do we bring that together to start getting some knowledge or create something that we can use and make decisions on and that's what the last part is the strategies how do we start creating solutions and give you something in return that you can you know take to the boards take to your communities and start doing some uh, you know implementation on the ground if you will um, 
And I do like walking through the story. My background is more in coastal geomorphology and understanding kind of bluff dynamics and erosion. So this is more dear to my heart, but like I said, I know there's not maybe bluff issues in this area. But we start out a lot of our case studies with these local stories and examples of what the problem is, and, and this is very relevant to this issue. And we can walk through from a before, during, and after kind of time frame. So here's a building official took this photo during a building permit process. And about four years later, on a 100 foot high bluff looking over Michigan, a great view, but most of your bluff starts to fail. And so this, through the, the, uh, the planning and the, and the zoning administrator within, and this is from Sheboygan County in Wisconsin, you know, we have these great pictures that really highlight what the issue is and, and what the hazard is and what the problem is that, you know, especially for this homeowner in this situation. And uh, approximately two years after that, this house was moved across the county highway. So it was, you know, they did own the land across the highway, so they were able to move. But what's in danger here is this entire county highway is in failure of falling into Lake Michigan, basically. And so that's what really, you know, this sets up the discussion of the awareness of the problem. So the, the private property and, and even public infrastructure are at risk in these types of hazards. So we can bring that in, and that's where we start creating the awareness around this type of issue. And in this example here, this is Concordia University just north of uh, Milwaukee, um, about $12 million, uh, most of that through bluff stabilization, but also some restructuring and armoring at the bottom of the shore. Um, and I know Gene and other folks know a lot more about this situation, but it really does highlight the, the amount of money that could go into trying to stabilize these types of bluffs and, and kind of avoid these types of hazards. So it's very important to you know, create the awareness of this then the next thing is how do we start creating an understanding of what the situation is? And this is where we start bringing in the science, that background information on looking at like waves at the toe of the bluff and the lake levels, how do those fit into this? So you need to know kind of where the wind patterns are within the Great Lakes. You need to understand what the lake levels are doing, what they have done and what they will do in the future. And some of that information like through the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, starting to put some of that forecast and information on um, future lake levels within the Great Lakes. Um, surface runoff, groundwater, the geology are all very important in understanding bluff and erosion conditions. So we can start bringing in that information uh -huh. and starting to do analysis with that. You know, what are the recession rates with the bluff toe and the bluff top over time? And where will that bluff kind of settle out if it wants to erode? Where is it kind of a stable angle for that bluff to be at? And there's a lot of analysis and research that has already been done on this. How do we make this accessible so people understand it and can bring it in and help people um, you know, communicate on the risk, especially around this um, erosion, but also flood hazards, water quality, all the other information that we want to talk about today. And then the last part is we can bring it together and start providing solutions and strategies, you know, building visualizations that show what happens over time. Excuse me. So on the kind of upper slide here, just, there's just kind of two time frames between 1956 and 2000. You know, you can start showing what happens to that bluff and how it's steepening and start looking at where the setback for that erosion, where that bluff might come. And then if you add like a building setback on top of that, and then the example here, it might be hard to see from this distance, but um, literally right now, if you, based on some of the applications and some of the science, you know, the setback line would be here, here's your highway. So right now, none of these houses could be built based on what we think is a safety factor for that area. And then there are um, counties that have started taking this information and building it into, um, and I know you can't read this, but it is developing a legally defensible shoreline ordinance for, and that's for Bayfield County, and that's what that is. So did not mean that to be intentionally to be read or anything, but wanted to highlight that, that they're starting to bring the science in and trying to develop ordinances around this type of information. And I'm not sure how much time I have left, but we're gonna get into the questions. And so we already kind of had warm-ups on this, but these are, um, again, the, they have three questions. Um, I have a warm-up question and three questions related to the, the planning guide for the breakout sessions the afternoon for each of those three topic areas that I talked about. And these are designed, we want to hone in on kind of an, an issue area, and then when you get to the breakout sessions, take that area, then the, the facilitators for each of those will go into deeper you know, discussion about an issue, trying to get to development of a case study within the region. So we want to look at potential case studies, as Heather had mentioned earlier, and, and start getting that information together. And um, you know, we will follow up and keep doing some discussion on this if, as we start seeing these come together. And so the quick and easy one, and this, um, 
I guess it is starting to get the, uh, the, the big 10 kind of groups in here. And I know somebody yelled out Iowa before. Sorry, Iowa. But, um, <laughs> Quick responses, I think everybody knows where they live. That's good. <laughs> I'll imagine that. So that was easy. Now, now the tougher questions. Uh, I don't think they're tough, but I think they're very relevant to all of our discussion. This, um, so this is related to the, I think the one o'clock breakout session on habitat and environment and is, what is the most important habitat and environmental issue for you? And it, um, if you need any help reading those, I think we have other rooms. Um, I know it take a little bit more time to look at those. If there's any clarification on something that's up there, but coastal wetlands and hazard kind of flood reduction and erosion reduction, kind of the same thing within the upland wetlands and riparian buffers, kind of grass strips, long corridors, riverine corridors uh, for flood reduction. Climbing fast now, I think people have latched onto it. I'm not sure where we're getting, but I think we have about 63, so. Sorry if you, uh, they're still coming. And we're, so it looks like wetlands and riparian buffers. So number three, I hope somebody can write this down for me because we want to take these into the session this afternoon. Um, and I think we'll also save this so I can come back and look at these before we get to the afternoon sessions. Uh, but this really will help the, the, uh, the, co the facilitators within each of those sessions in kind of structuring their conversations and, and diving more into this issue. <coughs> now we're getting into uh, the next group is the land use and zoning. So I think this is the two o'clock session with the planning guide land use and zoning issue that is most important to you. Anybody needs me to read these or clarify these? I think everybody caught on to it last pretty quickly. I think our threshold was right around 66, so we get there all. Two more, come on, two more. <laughs> ah, there we are, all right. Oh, a close one. Looks like the uh, lakefront waterfront land acquisition for parks and open space. And, and there will be a room with the facilitators, you know, we'll, we'll share this across there and maybe those that show up in the room, there might be a little bit different focus and, and I think they can, you know, kind of uh, adjust their conversation to facilitate that, so. Thank you. And then our last question is, what infrastructure issue? And we heard Tim talk a little bit about this this morning on the port issue. And so what infrastructure issue is most important to you? Almost done. Oh, 67, we had an extra one. This is a hotter topic. We're, we're reaching a record. Or maybe I just pushed the button too quickly last time. Oh, this, this, the infrastructure folks have to, they got a tie. So coastal, coastal shoreline protection and flood damage and the municipal water system. So Gene and Roger will, uh, get to help us walk through that one. And that is the end of uh, a thank you. And if there's any questions, the greatlakesresilience.org, the website is up there. There is a email address through the website if you want to go at it that way, info at Great Lakes Resilience, or just email me directly, Jeff Stone at jeff at floods.org. And I will be here all day as well um, and look forward to 